So here I have uh, the text, the ninth Karmapa's ocean of definitive meaning. The ninth Karmapa's ocean of definitive meaning. I'm going to read a, a chapter called Stabilizing the Mind After It Has Been Grasped. Yesterday of the two main topics of our text, Tranquility and Insight, we began to study Tranquility, and of the three sections of the presentation of Tranquility Meditation, we went through the first, which is grasping the mind when it is ungrasped. Today, we are going to study the second section, which is stabilizing the mind after it has been grasped. This refers to the stage that comes after you have been practicing Tranquility Meditation, uh, called Samatha, and have been working with your mind for some time and know therefore the basic method. You understand and have experienced the process of tranquility and can rest your mind in a state of tranquility to some degree. <clears throat> At this point, in order to help you progress further, the first thing that is presented is the Mahabrahma Samadhi of Stability. Now, normally when we say Mahabrahma, it refers to a god or deva of some kind. Here the term Brahma is used to mean purity. So Mahabrahma Samadhi refers to a Samadhi in which your mind's faculties, having been brought to stability, are heightened and therefore experienced in their purity. <clears throat> samadhi means nirvana, basically. Samadhi, samadhi is to, to meditate within um, nirvana, to meditate in such a way that thoughts don't arise, to meditate in such a way that we experience the pure, natural, peaceful nature um, of, of enlightenment. Samadhi is basically almost, uh, almost, uh, uh, what's the word, almost the same meaning, almost a synonym for enlightenment. Samadhi is a meditative state, which, uh, has to do with the cessation of the thoughts, like I said, mental outflows. Um, it's kind of hard to, de to describe it unless one experiences it themselves. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's like trying to describe the taste of Coca-Cola to uh, Aboriginal Indians, you know, in the forests of Brazil or something like that. I've never heard of anything of that nature. It's not possible to describe it using metaphors which which someone who uh, hasn't spent a lot of time meditating can relate to. So samadhi is like nirvana, a high level of meditation. So Mahabrahma samadhi refers to a samadhi in which your mind's faculties having brought having been brought to stability, are heightened and therefore experienced in their purity. The basis of this samadhi is the following visualization. In the center of your body, at the level of the heart, you visualize a four-petaled white lotus. And resting on this center of that lotus flower, you visualize a small sphere of extremely bright white light. It should be no larger than the size of a pea and should be visualized as very bright, even brilliant. Now previously, in the context of grasping the mind through the breathing, you learned how to hold your breath. Here you also hold your breath. Through holding your breath, you think that you cause this tiny brilliant sphere of white light to rise up from the lotus in your heart, upward through your body, from which it emerges, shooting up out the aperture at the center of the top of your head and continues to rise until it reaches the highest uh, reaches the highest uh, reaches of space above you while doing this you also put more exertion into your physical posture so that your posture is especially strict involving even a little tension you also raise your gaze so that you are looking upward, attempting to make your mind very bright, clear, and cheerful. Hmm. 
So he's talking about visualizing a white lotus in the center of our heart and a, a, a brilliant white sphere the size of a pea shining brilliantly and it gradually goes up through the central channel from the heart to the throat to the center of the brain and up through the top of the head shoots up into space up centrally all the way from the earth dare I say to the pole star which is directly north of the planet and which is associated um, with divinity and basically all world religions you want to visualize that it shoots up all the way from the top of your brain to the pole star And this is Maha Brahma Samadhi. <clears throat> the pole star, uh, if you look at the night sky, there's only one, it's the, the North Star, what we call the North Star. There's only one star that doesn't change. And there's a reason why it doesn't change its position. Because it's located directly above the Earth. The Earth spins around. Uh, the pole star as an axis, rather our solar system is, is, has its north axis to this pole star, um, which is the reason why we don't observe it spinning, and why if we take a, if you take, um, what you call it, like a time lapse, if you take a time lapse picture of the night sky, you'll see all the stars whirling around the pole star. You can type that in Google, stars around the pole star or the North Pole, and you'll see all the stars whirling around the pole star. So there's a special yogic connection between the central axis of the Earth and the central axis of the body. So I believe that's what they're referring to here in this very esoteric and cryptic uh, analogy. <coughs> Visualizing a lotus, four petal lotus at our heart, and then the ball of white light in the center, and it goes up the center channel and up out the top of our head into space directly above us. This meditation is useful if you find that your mind is unclear, torpid, or depressed, or when you find yourself uninterested in practice and your mind is dull. The Mahabrahma Samadhi of stability will serve to cheer you up and to clarify or promote lucidity in your mind. In the practice of both tranquility and insight, torpor is a problem. But it, it is especially a problem for practitioners of tranquility because the practice of tranquility meditation by its very nature emphasizes the achievement of stillness and stillness can, if you are not attentive, produce a state of torpor. Um, I believe torpor means like inertia. This technique is introduced at this point to in enable one to maintain stillness while dispelling the torpor that can accompany it. For the proper practice of tranquility meditation, the mind's lucidity needs to be at full strength. It should be not weakened in any way by the stillness one is cultivating. So this practice helps one uh, helps within the context of stillness to promote and even increase the mind's lucidity. The second meditation in this section of tranquility instruction is called the subterranean samadhi which is similar in a way to the previous instruction except that it is a remedy for exactly the opposite problem sometimes we find that our mind are unable to, our minds are unable to come to rest that we are excited by the thoughts that pass through our minds and cannot let go of them generally this is some kind of pleasant excitement during which you cannot stop yourself from recollecting pleasant things pleasant memories and so on it is like, for example, when you are excited by something that you cannot go, uh, when you are so excited by something that you cannot go to sleep. This obviously disturbs the practice of meditation. A second and in some ways similar state uh, is one in which you are disturbed by thoughts of intense regret, regretting things that you have done or things that have happened in the past that you cannot let go of. In either case, whether it is excitement or regret, it is equally disturbing to the practice of meditation because it causes the mind to become unstable. This meditation, the subterranean samadhi, is designed to serve as a remedy or antidote for the problem. For this problem, 
Here, in the center of your body, at the level of the heart, you visualize a lotus flower as before, four-petaled, except that here, because you are visualizing the flower in order to pacify or cool down the mind, instead of visualizing it as white, you visualize it as black. Also, because you are trying to bring your mind's energy downward, you visualize the lotus flower as facing downward. And then you think that resting on the center of the lotus flower, which is facing downward, and of course, now on the underside, is a tiny sphere of black light. Again, visualized as no larger than a pea, so that the meditation is sharply focused. Then you think that the sphere of black light descends from where it starts out, going down through your body. It comes out the bottom and continues going down far into and below the ground. Furthermore, while doing this, you think that this sphere of black light is not something physically lit, uh, is not something physically light, but very heavy, rather. <clears throat> not, not physically light, but a very heavy, dense uh, black pea. And that its heaviness or weight causes it to descend through and below the earth. At this point, two techniques have been presented in this section. The first, the Mahabrahma Samadhi, is presented as a remedy for dullness, and the second, the Subterranean Samadhi, as a remedy for the wildness of either excitement or regret. Uh, I think that's, that's very, very useful. I've never read anything like that before, but it's very, very useful indeed. The third instruction presented here is simply to apply either one of those as needed, depending upon your experience. Any given person will at different times experience both torpor and wildness of mind. So when your mind is dull, you practice the Mahabrahma Samadhi, and when your mind is wild, you practice the Subterranean Samadhi. That you should apply these two meditations as needed constitutes the third instruction in this section of the book, uh, the Karmapa, the ninth Karmapa's Ocean of Definitive Meaning. Many problems can come up in the practice of meditation. By problems here, I do not mean final impediments that will destroy the path, but temporary stumbling blocks. Of these, two are the most common, torpor and wildness of mind. These techniques are presented here in order to overcome these two tendencies. You pacify the tendency to torpor by practicing the Mahabrahma Samadhi, you pacify the tendency to wildness and excitement um, or, or regret and doubt, uh, or regret rather, not really doubt, but regret. Uh, wildness and excitement or regret by practicing the subterranean Samadhi. It is necessary to overcome both of these tendencies so that your mind can come to rest naturally. Next in a section of the three sections that make up the presentation of Tranquility Meditation or Samatha, calm, calm Abiding Meditation it's sometimes called, comes the instruction in the nine methods or stages of bringing mind uh, to rest. The first of nine is called placement. Placement here means the initial process of bringing the mind to some kind of rest or stability. This is accomplished by applying the methods taught under the category of grasping the mind when it is ungrasped. As you will remember, this process consists of training the sixth consciousness not to follow or be caught by the thoughts that arise within it. These thoughts are of various kinds, but regardless of the thought's content, it is to be treated in the same way at this stage. Thoughts can be very negative, they can be made up of various kleshas. They can be what we regard as unvirtuous, but one does not follow them in the practice of tranquility. And even if thoughts are virtuous in the presence of tranquility meditation, they are still regarded as a potential source of disturbance. Usually we think that virtuous thoughts are not a problem, but in the practice of tranquility meditation, a virtuous thought can be just as disturbing or distracting as an unvirtuous one. So therefore, in this first stage of the nine stages or nine methods of bringing the mind to rest, you are attempting to maintain a state in which your mind is placed at rest and yet without impairing the mind's lucidity. The mind is still at rest but not dull and maintains its brilliant lucidity. Now, at this stage, which is the stage of a beginning practitioner of tranquility meditation, this state will not last very long. 
Nevertheless, getting your mind to the point at which it comes to rest while maintaining its natural lucidity for however brief a period is the first of the nine stages. Placement. When you practice this first discipline, the discipline of placement, repeatedly, eventually there occurs some prolonging of the state of stillness, the state of the mind being at rest. This state of rest, which was previously achieved as the first of the nine stages, when somewhat prolonged, constitutes the second stage called prolonged placement. In the same state of rest as experienced in the first stage, uh, it is the same state of rest as experienced in the first stage, but here it is lasting longer. Then, through cultivating the second stage, you reach the third stage, which has two different names. In this text, it is called definite placement, or certain placement, but in other contexts, it is called returning placement. While returning placement is not the term used in this text, it is perhaps the most descriptive term for this stage, and for the following reason. In achieving the third stage, you are obviously still practicing the second, which means that you are working with a somewhat prolonged state of stillness. Nevertheless, it is not prolonged indefinitely. At some point, thoughts arise. The discipline and practice of the third stage consists of not wandering on the basis of the arising of a thought, not being caught by it, not following it, but instead recognizing that a thought has arisen. When a thought arises, one recognizes it, thinking, a thought has arisen, my mind is not at rest. And on the basis of that recognition, one returns to the state of stillness. That is why the most descriptive term for the third stage is returning placement, although in our text it is called certain or definite placement. The fourth method of resting the mind, called close placement, refers to resting in the state of stillness in which you have returned when, through applying the mindfulness and alertness enjoined in the third method, you have recognized the arising of a thought and have been able to return to that state of placement or stillness. So close placement consists of resting in or remaining in placement subsequent to your return to that state. But despite such resting, there will continue to be disturbances of various kinds. Sometimes you may be disturbed by your thoughts. Sometimes your mind may become dull or torpid or sleepy. Sometimes you may be afflicted by lack of interest in the practice itself. The next two methods, the fifth and the sixth, are both remedies to these problems. Either one can be applied as a remedy, however, they are enumerated separately because they are different techniques or methods. The fifth, which is called taming, is recollection of the qualities or benefits of samadhi. When your mind is torpid or disturbed, when it is difficult to practice, when you find yourself uninterested in practice, the fifth method, taming, is a, is a way of recollecting why you are practicing tranquility meditation, why you, why you are practicing tranquility meditation, and the benefits of doing so. The immediate benefits of tranquility meditation are physical and mental well-being. The ultimate benefit of tranquility meditation is the pacification of kleshas or med mental afflictions. Now, we cannot say that the eradication of mental afflictions because tranquility alone uh, now we cannot say the eradication of mental afflictions because tranquility alone is insufficient to eradicate mental afflictions. That is accomplished through insight meditation. The reason tranquility alone cannot eradicate the afflictions is that it does not contain enough discernment, enough pragna. But tranquility does weaken the mental afflictions. Literally, the Tibetan term here, go nun pa, which means to suppress. But it is not suppression in the terms of a sense of repression of mental afflictions, it is more the idea of debilitating or weakening the mental afflictions. In any case, <clears throat> through the application of the fifth method you promote your enthusiasm for the practice by recollecting its benefits and to the degree one generates enthusiasm, one's enthusiasm naturally and spontaneously reduce, uh, reduces the amount of effort required to bring the mind to rest. The more enthusiastic you are about the practice, the more effortlessly your mind will come to rest. For example, in the life of Jitsun Milarepa, soon after he had received his initial instructions from Lord Marpa, he went into retreat in a cave called Tiger Nuk at the south, uh, southern cliffs near Marpa's residence, uh, residence. While Milarepa was in retreat there, Marpa came to see him and said to Milarepa, You are practicing very diligently, but why? Do you not take a break? 
and Milarepa said, I do not need to take a break. Practice itself is taking a break. Milarepa perceived practice as a state of rest or a state of relaxation because of his enthusiasm for it. Because he was so enthusiastic, he perceived diligent effort. Uh, he perceived diligent practice as effortless. Now, we are not Milarepa, but nevertheless, to the extent that we recollect the benefits of tranquility meditation, to the same extent we will perceive it as effortless. The sixth method of resting the mind deals in some cases with the same problems and in other cases with similar problems as dealt with by the fifth. In the fifth, the mind is tamed or subdued through the recollection of the benefits of samadhi of stillness. In the sixth, called pacification, the mind is pacified through recollecting what is wrong with thoughts. Often, when we are overpowered by our thoughts, when we cannot stop thinking, it is because we regard the practice <clears throat> it is because we regard the particular thoughts that we are entertaining as either valuable because they are pleasurable or valuable because they are in some way important. In either case, the problem is that we are attaching some kind of undeserved value and importance to the thoughts. That is why we hold on to them. The sixth method is simply to recollect that in the context of meditation practice, thoughts are completely useless. They serve no function, they are no good whatsoever, they are a complete waste of time, and they impede the practice of dharma. This recollection is what is wrong with thinking, uh, will naturally cause you to stop liking thoughts. And when you do not like them, when you do not enjoy thinking, then you will not need to repress your thoughts. You will not need to try consciously to stop thinking, because if you do not like something, you will simply not do it. So the sixth method called pacification is to recollect the defects of thinking. Um, and when he says this, we can't... It, it has to be understood from the perspective of, of uh, the great meditative equipoise of, that they're talking about. Because when it's not that there's no wisdom in this deep equipoise. There's, there's omniscient wisdom, but there's no thoughts. There's a non-conceptual wisdom which is there without thoughts, is what they're talking about. Not that a person becomes dumb. <clears throat> and if we think about it, thoughts really aren't wisdom. Thoughts are kind of logical supports, but wisdom doesn't have, you know, a conceptual structure. It's, it's like all-pervading in our mind. The seventh method of resting the mind is called thorough pacification. Now sometimes when we practice med meditation there are no problems and as long as there are no problems, as long as your mind is not distracted or disturbed, you simply continue in the state of placement. But sometimes of course there are problems and here the point is not to attempt to solve these problems, specifically the disturbances caused by thoughts through force. One is not to attempt to force thoughts not to arise by thinking, I must not allow my mind to move at all. Here the method employed involves selecting one thought or one type of thought from among the many that might arise in your mind and the rest in that. The method employed involves selecting one thought or one type of thought from among the many that might be arising in your mind and rest in that. Thoughts can arise with unlimited variety of content. We, all, we have all kinds of thoughts, especially disturbing thoughts include thoughts of spite, the wish to harm someone, thoughts of jealousy or competitiveness, and thoughts of regret and guilt. Pleasant thoughts include thoughts of excitement, recollection of pleasure, and so forth. In this method you recognize one particular thought that has arisen. And here you are not treating thought as an abstraction or a generality, but you are working with one particular thought and you rest in that thought. When you rest in that thought, you are not attempting to fight the thought, you are not attempting to get rid of it, stop it, or suppress it, you are resting in it, and when you rest in it, the thought dissolves. Now in the text it says that if through resting in a thought you succeed in thoroughly recognizing its nature, the stuff of which it is made, it will be self-liberated. That's important there to understanding um, uh, uh, Tibetan Buddhist meditation in, in some contexts. If through resting in a thought you succeed in thoroughly recognizing its nature, the stuff of which it is made, it will be self-liberated. This method of resting in the thought rather than attempting to suppress it is the seventh technique through pacification.
Through the application of the first seven methods of resting the mind, you achieve the ability to apply the eighth and ninth methods. The eighth is called unification. Unification here refers to the stage at which, through the preceding diligent application of the fifth, sixth, and seventh methods as remedies for problems in meditation, you no longer need to apply force in your meditation practice. You are no longer trying to force anything. Therefore, there is no fluctuation or oscillation between the state of relaxed meditation and the state of forced meditation in response to problems. So the eighth method or stage unification really refers to the point when your mind is resting naturally. This in turn leads to the ninth and last stage called even placement, which is a state in which there is no longer any distraction. The term even or equal here means specifically that your mind is in a state of placement free both of the defects of tension and of excessive sloppy relaxation. The absence of tension and of the need, of, need for force and the absence of sloppy relaxation or distraction allow the quality of the placement of your mind, of the resting of your mind, to become thoroughly even or equal. These nine methods of resting the mind are presented so that you understand what tranquility meditation is, what the process of bringing the mind to stillness is, and how to proceed or get on with it. Therefore, the presentation of these two topics, the nine methods of resting the mind and the pre preceding three samadhis practiced as remedies or antidotes for disturbances, make up the second of the three sections here, which is stabilizing the mind after it has been gotten a hold of or grasped. So at this point we have completed the first two of the three sections of presentation of tranquility meditation, grasping the mind when it is ungrasped and stabilizing it when it has been grasped, and each contains various sections. If you look at your text you will see that these subsections are numbered as teaching sessions and practice sessions. These are two parallel numbering systems that are nevertheless different from each other.